I hope that you are uh, nearing the end of your meal and that you've enjoyed. There are a few leftovers, but not a lot. Uh, we are just delighted with the turnout tonight, so thank you guys for making it a point to be here. Uh, I told Claire last week when the weather was coming in and uh, a lot of people were sick with COVID, I said, uh, even if we only have 30 people uh, that get trained in evangelism, even though we'll spend on the, a lot of money and waste a bunch of food, it'll still be worth it if 30 people know how to share the gospel and go out and do that. So it's even better that we get to train a crowd of this size, and uh, I'm just delighted, really, really thankful that y'all are here. A few things I want to let you know ahead of time. If you didn't get a paper or if you have a janky pen that won't write, just raise your hand and we will bring you one of each. So got a few back there. Uh, it, it, again, if you have any issues throughout, uh, there's extra pens somewhere. Just raise your hand and we'll try to take care of you. Uh, it is my pleasure to get to introduce to you uh, Devin Huddleston. You may know her as Devin Bond. She's been and spoken just briefly at the church a few times. Uh, but tonight she's going to come and train us. She works for Stumo. She's on college campuses. They share the gospel every single week. The, uh, she's gotten used to this, and it, I don't know that it ever gets easy or feels normal, but she's very gifted. She came and trained our staff a few months ago, and we were so encouraged. We were like, man, we've got to share this with the church. And so would you put your hands together and welcome Devin Huddleston. Thank you. Okay, so it was May 14th, 2012, my 16th birthday. I was headed to get, take the test to get my driver's license, so pretty big day at that age. I remember being very low on confidence when it came to the actual driving portion of my exam. I felt very good about the written test. I aced that thing. But then I get in the car with the instructor, and he says, okay, we're going to start with parallel parking. You're just going to go right up there and parallel park. And I was like, oh my gosh, I think that's impossible. And so I go up, go to Parallel Park, and as I'm just attempting it, he says, okay, you can stop now. You just needed to try. And I was like, oh gosh, I just failed my driver's test. This is terrible. But we continue. It gets a little better from there. Um, my drive was far from perfect. I was scared out of my mind the entire time, but I finished, and thankfully I passed. I got my license. And as I got my license and drove more and more, I was still nervous, but I slowly grew in confidence. The more times I got behind the wheel, the more confident I became. became. It just took practice. Today, I'm a pretty confident driver. I don't get behind the wheel and like get nervous or <laughs> freak out about where I'm headed. But, and it's really not because of my skills. I'm not like the best driver. My husband would probably tell you that. But I just am more confident because I've had a lot of practice. And so my feelings and experience with driving for the first time very much relate to how I felt when I first shared my faith. So I remember about eight years ago, I had just put my trust in Christ, um, and I, may, I meet this girl in my class named Ada. Ada was from China, um, and as I start to talk with her, I learn that she has no idea who Jesus is. She's never heard of the Bible. Not only does she just not know who Jesus is, she has absolutely no idea of what God has done for her, what Jesus did for her on the cross. And so when I hear this, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I, I guess I have to tell her. She doesn't really have many friends here. She's from China, you know, came by herself, and I knew she would go back to China soon, and so, and probably wouldn't have anyone there to tell her about Jesus, and so I knew that I had to do it. So I remember going to my friend, Chantel, and saying, hey, will you teach me how to share my faith? And I remember feeling so nervous. I was, didn't feel prepared at all to share my faith with Ada, but I just did it anyways. And if I could go back to that conversation now and like just listen, I would probably cringe. I'm sure I was so awkward. I'm sure I said things maybe that Ada didn't understand at all since she had never even heard anything at all about Jesus. And so I'm sure it just wasn't the best illustration, but I just did it anyways. And I got to share the gospel. I got to tell her the most important thing and the most important news that she would ever hear, that Jesus died on the cross for her sins and that she could have a relationship with God through him. 
Ada didn't trust in Christ that day. It was the first time she had ever heard it, heard the gospel. But what happened that day was I just really gained this desire to grow in my confidence and to grow in my skills to continue sharing my faith. I wanted to be able to share my faith not only with foreign exchange students, but with girls in my sorority and girls on my track team and just my family members and people around me. And so I knew that that meant I needed to learn more skills and just grow my confidence and keep doing it so that I could keep sharing with other people. I know a lot of us, if not all of us, have similar feelings when it comes to sharing our faith. We love Jesus, and we've experienced the joy and the benefits of having a relationship with him, and we know that people who don't have a relationship with God will face eternal judgment in hell, and we know that we should share the gospel with them. But a lot of times, just because we have these fears and feelings of inadequacy, inadequacy, we don't get behind the wheel. And so I am so excited to be here today because I just want to give you guys four steps on how to grow in your confidence so that you can tell your friends and coworkers and neighbors about Jesus as well. Uh, so like I said, it's been about eight years since I shared my faith for the first time. I've done it a lot since then, but I still get nervous. It's not just like super easy for me. I, I work, I have these fears, I have to pray through them and just tell myself, hey, it's worth it. And so I'm, I'm excited that I get nervous still. I don't want to portray that you like just do this with confidence every single time. I love that I get nervous because it really does make me rely on the Lord. It makes me pray and beg him to do what only he can do in someone's life. And so I'm not saying you're going to walk out of here and just be like, oh my gosh, I'm ready to tell the world about Jesus. I hope you are, but it's okay if you're not like, I'm so confident at this. So regardless of where you're at in evangelism, maybe you've never shared your faith, or maybe you're a vet and you're just looking for another tool to do it more often, regardless of where you're at, I really think that tonight can just help you, um, yeah, anywhere you're at, just help you grow in evangelism. Um, before I want to say anything else, I, Jason kind of said this earlier, but I just want to say I'm really encouraged that all of you guys are here. Like, I mean, when you say the word evangelism, that's like when people kind of start like, palms are sweaty, like no one wants to do that. It's kind of intimidating. And so just the fact that you guys all chose to come, maybe someone drug you here, but you still chose to be here and to come do a training on sharing your faith. I'm just really encouraged. And it says a lot about this church and this community. And so I'm pumped that you're here. I told Jason I'd be excited to talk to 10 people, but it's like 150 and that's even better. And so I love that you're here. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. We'll be on that first handout um, of that packet. And so these are four steps to sharing your faith with confidence. And the first one, that underline, is realize what success is. But what if I don't do everything perfectly? What if they ask me questions that I don't know the answer to? What if they reject me? What if I fail? I'm sure you've had similar thoughts when it comes to sharing your faith. I know that I have. Most of the time, I think we lack confidence in evangelism because we don't know what success in evangelism is. We like to determine it or we tend to determine it by how well we do or how that person responds. And so this is what, how we view evangelism. Um, a positive response, so say someone, you share the gospel and someone responds positively, that is good and that's a success. But maybe a negative response, maybe someone who said, oh, I don't want to do that, that doesn't sound like, that doesn't sound great to me. It's your thing, not mine. Then we are maybe feeling defeated and feeling like that was bad and a fail. A fail. So that's how we typically think, but that's not what the Bible says at all. So this scripture is on your handout. It'll be on the screen as well. We're going to read through it. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. So this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. And he says, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. In, the, in these verses, Paul is saying that when he came to share the news of Jesus with the Corinthians, he didn't try to impress them with fancy words or with his knowledge. Paul knew a lot about Jesus. He was very well-trained and read about everything in the Bible. And so he didn't try to impress them with his knowledge. He simply told them that Jesus died for their sins. He was scared to death, unsure of how to go about it, and he felt inadequate. But he had confidence that God would show up and use him somehow. That way, he knew that when transformation happened, he knew that it was God and not him. This scripture is so encouraging to me when it comes to evangelism, because when I think of Paul, I typically just think of his boldness. I feel like he was always staring death in the face and like not even batting an eye. But in this passage, we see that he was scared when it came to telling the Corinthians about Jesus. And I feel very relatable to Paul because of that. Also, we see in this scripture that um, because of what we do, like when we share our faith, we see that res the results aren't up to us. They're up to God. So when we share our faith, we can view it as a success because we know that God is going to use it somehow. Just like Paul said, it's not him, it is, the, is God. And so the good news about sharing the good news is that it's always a win-win situation. So instead of the pass-fail thinking that we're used to, it looks more like this. A positive response is good and a success, and a negative response is also good and a success. It's good and a success and a success because we're planting a seed. We're being obedient to God by sharing our faith, and we're growing in our own faith. Bill Bright, a famous campus minister, words it this way. He says, success in evangelism is simply sharing Christ in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. So God saves us, and he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit to boldly step out and share our faith. And when we do, he takes care of the results. So he does it all. So we get all the credit, or so he gets all the credit, but he chooses to include us in it. How cool is that? So success in evangelism for us is as simple as that. Step out in faith and share the gospel. Now this can be helpful to grow our confidence, and there's so much more we could say on the topic about prayer and the power of scripture and God's sovereignty and more. But one of the most common reasons that people don't share their faith is because they don't know how. And there's a principle that's true in evangelism and really all of life, and it's the principle that competence generates confidence. The more you know how to do something, the more confident you're going to feel actually doing it, and the more likely that you are to do it if you feel confident in it. I recently heard a statistic that only 4% of evangelical American churches teach their members how to share their faith. And I'm encouraged and I'm so excited that Cross Community is, not, is in that 4%. And so I'm just excited that you guys have staff and elders and leaders that are wanting to not only teach you why you should share your faith, but also teaching you how to do it like we are tonight. And so for the rest of the time, we're just going to get really practical. Um, I'm going to teach you guys an illustration and kind of how to just get into this illustration, and you guys will learn how to share your faith. But in evangelism, if we can just start with a deep abiding trust in the Lord and believing that he is in charge of the results, and if we can combine that with a simple plan of how to share our faith, we very quickly become people that God can use in mighty ways when we step out and share faith. So we're gonna get practical now. The next blank is use a line. So it's helpful to have an idea of what you will say to naturally transition into spiritual conversations. 
So as you're doing life, maybe you're at your kid's soccer practice, you're at a family gathering, work, running errands around town, we should be people who are aware of the spiritual needs around us. And that awareness leads us to talk to people, to invest in them, to love them, and for the sake of sharing the gospel with them. So how do you go from talking about the weather, work, school, COVID, to, to talking about spiritual things? So I have some tips for you, just some questions that I like to use. I call these transition questions. They just transition smoothly into talking about the weather or whatever to talking about spiritual things. And so did you grow up going to church? Or was, is God a big priority for you? Have you ever read the Bible much? So these are very casual just questions that you can ask as you're just sitting and talking, sitting and talking with someone at your kid's basketball game. Just as you're getting to know them, hey, did your family grow up in church? Or are, are you attending church now? What does that look like for you? And as you just learn more about them, you, they will most likely ask you, hey, do you go to church? They'll want to learn more about you, and it just kind of opens the door for you to get to share with them. So these simple questions will help you identify with Christ in a way that could lead really smoothly into asking for an opportunity to share the gospel. So now I want to share with you, so those are some transition questions, but now I'm going to share a line with you that I like to use that just sets up an opportunity for me to actually share the gospel with them. So I have it on the slide, and it's also on your second page of your handout as well. But it says, hey, I learned a way to explain what the whole Bible is about by just using one verse. I think you'd really like it. Can I show it to you? So I don't say that verbatim every single time I say it, but I say something pretty close. I just, hey, I have this illustration that sums up the main theme of the Bible. Can I show you? I think you'd really like it. And they usually say yes. Like, who says no to that when you say, I think you'll really like it? So, um, I want you guys to actually pause for a second and turn to the person next to you and say that line. You can read it. I don't expect you to have it memorized, but you can just read it and say it to them and both of you practice. Okay, sounds like you guys got it. So basically you ask this question, they say yes, boom, you get to share the gospel with them. So I wanna actually teach you guys how I do that in a way that I really like. And so the tool that I'm gonna show you guys, it's best for like a sit down conversation, maybe it's over meal or coffee, but just maybe an atmosphere that has minimal distractions. And I'm sure you're thinking like, my life is so crazy, I never have minimal distractions. And so this is why we use this line. And this is why we kind of set something up for the future of maybe, you can, maybe you're at work and you use this line with your coworker. It's probably not the best time to just stop work and share the gospel, but maybe that next day you could go to lunch with your coworker and sit down and share the illustration I'm gonna show you. Maybe sometimes you will get to share the gospel on the spot, and that's great. But other times you're just setting up a time in the future to get with them with minimal distractions. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to use some version of this line, and I really can't think of many people that say no. I mean, it's just pretty, like, I don't know. You just say, I think you'd like it, and they're like, yeah, sure. So it's great. Use the line. Um, okay, the next step, this is the big one. Share the clear gospel. So there's lots of options out there with sharing the gospel. Your personal testimony, illustration, gospel tracts, etc. But for me, the tool that I've most used is the Romans 623 illustration, which is what I'll be showing you tonight. So Brooke, the girl that led me to Christ and discipled me in college, it's what she used when I clearly understood the gospel for the first time. And it's just what I first learned when I shared my faith with Ada. And I have just kept using it since. Um, it's the first way I learned and I just haven't really stopped. Um, but I wanna share with you guys just some reasons why I like it, reasons why I think this tool is just a great tool. Um, first reason is that it's clear. So it's just one verse. It has an illustration that we'll draw out, 
and so people can kind of see it if they're visual learners. And I just don't typically get a lot of questions about it because it's just one verse. You're not going like in too deep, but you get to share the gospel through the one verse. Also, it's interactive. So this is one of my favorite things about this illustration because it's not just me talking all the time like I am right now. I would rather have a conversation with someone and ask them questions. And so that's how Romans 6.23 is. It's a it's a dialogue as you're sharing the gospel. Another reason is that it's simple. It's a single verse, and it's a really popular verse, and so a lot of people have maybe seen it before, but you really just walk through the verse and kind of dictionary define some of the words in it to make the illustration. So every summer at our um, discipleship program called Kaleo, we teach college students this illustration. And within like a two hour training, just like tonight, they walk out and go share the gospel on the beach. And so it's not, it's not a hard thing to learn. It takes practice and you get better at it over time for sure. But it's, it's pretty simple to learn. Also, it's versatile, so I'm going to teach us like the bare bones illustration of it, but it's designed to just relate to a lot of people. I don't share it the same way every single time I share it. Obviously, I keep the gospel the same. That doesn't change, but just kind of who I'm talking to, I kind of highlight different things based off of maybe their story or what they've told me so far. And so you can, I've shared it with grandmas on the beach. I've shared it with people from other countries. I've shared it with my family and even just college girls. And so you really can kind of just make it make it for whoever you're sharing it with. And lastly, it's effective. Like Paul, I know that I'm not winning people to Christ by a fancy illustration or, you know, my wise words, but it's him working in their life. But I have seen God use this illustration to lead many people to Christ, myself being one of those. So I'm excited to teach it to you guys. So what we're going to do I will teach it, so my friend Haley is going to come up on stage, and if you flip to that second page in your handout, you'll see that there's three different sections of this, and so I actually don't have one. Claire, could I get one of this? Um, so there's actually three different sections of this, and we will walk through it section by section, um, and then you guys will practice it. So I know it can maybe feel like a little awkward depending on like if you're sitting with someone that you feel uncomfortable doing with, but it's fine. Just step past the awkwardness and share. I'm not expecting you guys to like hear me do it one time and then be like, oh my gosh, I got this all from memory. I'm just wanting you to try it. And so you can literally read through it as you share it with the person next to you, but I'm just wanting you to try. I think it'll be really beneficial because like I said, competence generates confidence. And so if you practice it tonight, you're going to be more confident moving forward. And so part one of this, Haley, this is my friend Haley. Welcome her up. <laughs> yep, there we go. Okay, so part one is the bad news. And so our objective, as you see on the paper, is to help them understand that they are sinful and separated from God. So I want to take a few seconds just for you guys to read through that one through five, just so you can kind of get an idea of where we're headed, and then Haley and I will illustrate that for you guys. Okay, so we're pretending that Haley is a girl that maybe last week I said, hey Haley, I have this illustration that sums up the main theme of the Bible. I'd love to show it to you. Can we get together next week for lunch? She says yes, and so here we are. <laughs> At lunch, I'm getting to share my faith with Haley for the first time. Okay, so we start. I'm just, I'm literally going to illustrate this for you and try to not stop and like explain so that way I can just show you what it looks like and then you guys are going to practice it. So, Haley, I have this verse that sums up the main theme of the Bible. It's Romans 6.23. Could you read it for me? Yeah. Um, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Awesome. Have you ever heard that verse before? No, I don't think I have. Cool. Okay, well, we're just going to basically walk through this verse and, like, dictionary to find some of the, the key words. And so the first word that we come to is the word wages. Our first key word is the word wages. So what comes to mind when you hear the word wage? Mm, like money? Yeah, I think of, like, minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Like, you earn that money. And so a wage is just something earned. 
Okay, and then the next key word we come to is the word sin. So, what would your definition of sin be? How would you define it? Mm, maybe just like bad things. Yeah, yeah. The Bible, the definition of sin is like missing the perfect mark of God. And so, definitely any of the bad things we do are sin. So, who do you think sins? Mm, I think everyone, right? Yeah, for okay. sure. Yep, everyone sins. That's what the Bible says. So, <laughs> um, the next word is death. So obviously we know what death is, but why do we get sad when people we love pass away? Probably because we don't see them anymore. Yeah, it's like you can't just give them a call on the phone and mm -hmm. talk to them. You're separated from them. And so that's what this word is meaning. Separation. So, so mm -hmm. what this first line of this verse says is what we've earned for missing the perfect mark of God is separation, and that separation is from God. And so if, we, if these were two cliffs and we were on this side, like you and I were on this side, and God was on this side, what would be separating us from him? Mm, sin? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's what this first line says. What we've earned for our sin is to be separated from God. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Cool. Okay, that's part one. So now it's your turn. You're just going to get with someone next to you, and we're going to give you like five minutes or so for each of you to run through that illustration. It's okay if you're not perfect at it. No one's expecting that, but it's just getting familiar with it. Okay, how are you guys feeling about the first section? Maybe like a thumbs up. Okay, I see thumbs up. That's great. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, we're going to keep moving. We'll go to part number two. So this is the good news. So it's the objective of this part is to help them see that God offers us eternal life as a free gift because Christ paid the penalty for our sins. And so now if you could just read through one through four, and just kind of see where we're headed with that, and then we'll demonstrate. Okay, so the next key word we come to, Haley, is gift. So how is a gift different than a wage? Mm, because it's given. Yeah, yeah, I think of like a birthday present, a birthday gift. You don't work for that. It's yeah. free or unearned. Exactly. Okay, what does it say that this gift is? Eternal life. Yeah. Eternal life. And so... If we said death was a separation from God, what would you think eternal life is? Mm, like living with God forever? Yes. Living with God forever. So I'm going to write forever with God. Yeah, so it's like forever with God in a relationship. Great. Okay, so it says that this gift is in Christ Jesus. So I like to point out three things about Jesus, just because we could say so many things about him. But three things I like to point out is, one, that he was perfect. So he lived for 33 years on earth and never even sinned, which is crazy. Wow. Two is that he rose. Well, he <laughs> died on the cross. <laughs> he did that first. He died on cross. And then three is that he rose. And so because these things are true of Jesus, when he died on the cross, hope y'all can see this, he cancels out our sin because he had none, and he gave us a way to have a relationship with God. So before, we couldn't get to God, but now, because of Jesus, he bridged the gap between us. And so Jesus is defined as our Lord. What do you think of when you hear Lord. Mm, like a ruler? Yeah, I think of like a landlord. They have mm -hmm. authority. And so Jesus, Lord just means all authority. So he, being Jesus, has all authority. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about any of this? Mm, no, that makes sense. Awesome. Okay. Ah. <laughs> That's part two. There's a little bit more in that. So if you guys get stuck, just follow along in the handout and ask those questions as they come up. Also, the staff know how to share this, and so if you have staff around you, they're experts, so you can reach out to them and raise your hand or something. 
All right, we'll get started with part three now. So this is the response. So it, the objective says, help them see that they must individually turn and trust in Christ. So I will say before you guys read through this, um, I do add something to it. You will see as we go, I'll mention it within the illustration when I add it. Um, but I just think it's a helpful, helps you indicate where the other person might be in their uh, relationship with God or not in a relationship. And so I add something in there and then also wanted to point out, it says give a short testimony. Um, if you don't know how to share your testimony, I actually have a handout on the back of this, which we won't go through. Well, I'll mention it later tonight, but, and Haley's actually going to give her testimony, but um, if you don't know how to share testimony yet, that's okay. You can kind of just skip that step. Um, but it does say, I also want to mention a brief testimony. So this isn't like a 12 minute of everything that's happened since you were born and tell your whole life story. It's just kind of how you made that decision to turn and trust in Jesus. So um, go ahead and read through one through five, and then we'll get started. Okay, Haley, so this verse tells us what God has done for us through sending Jesus to die on the cross. But just like with any gift, so it says that there's this gift of eternal life, but with any gift, you have two options. You can either take it or leave it. You don't have to accept a gift. But with this gift of eternal life, the Bible talks about two things that we do in order to accept this gift. And it's turn and trust. And so that just means turning away from living a life for yourself and trusting that Jesus is Lord, trusting that these things are true and that he's the only way to have a relationship with God. This is where I add something. Mm -hmm. um, so typically when I share this with people, um, there's three different types of people, and I'm going to just put X's to indicate them. And so person number one over here, maybe I share this with them and they're like, oh, I don't believe any of that. Mm -hmm. I, maybe they're a different religion or um, just don't believe anything like that. And then person number two, this is maybe someone who grew up in church their whole life and maybe they've heard about God and say they're a Christian, but they've never made the one-time decision to turn and trust mm -hmm. in Jesus for their salvation. And then there's person number three, and this is someone who has made this decision and accepted this gift of eternal life. And so for most of my life, I was person number two. Mm -hmm. I grew up going to church and knew all the Bible answers, and I could tell you what Jesus had done, but I really thought that following Jesus meant being a good person. Mm -hmm. I thought that if I did the right things and didn't do the, the wrong things, that I could go to heaven. I thought I could earn my way to heaven. And it wasn't until I got to college, my freshman year, and I saw this exact same illustration. My friend Brooke showed it to me, and that's when I finally understood that I couldn't earn my way to heaven. And so mm -hmm. I made the decision to turn from my sin and trust in Jesus my freshman year of college. And now I would say I'm this person. So Haley, which ex or which person would you say you identify with? Mm, I'd say the second probably because I don't think I've made the decision to fully trust in Jesus. Yeah. Well, would you want to make that decision? Do you want to turn and trust in Jesus today? Yeah, I would. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So Haley just put her trust in Christ. That's great. Um, but that is part three. Um, you guys can now practice that. So that was all of the illustration. You guys just shared the gospel, the Romans 623 illustration. I think we should maybe cheer. That sounds appropriate. <laughs> awesome. So we actually just wanted to take a moment. Jason has a mic. Um, we just want to see if there's any questions that people have about the illustration or maybe just something you wanted me to run back through because you missed it or it wasn't clear. If, if they decide to, to make a decision to follow Christ, do you pray with them? Do you lead them in a prayer? How does that usually work? Yeah, that's a good question. So if they say yes, um, I typically ask the question like, hey, how do you think your life will look different after making this decision? And because a lot of times they'll just kind of say, well, I'll go to church more. I'll do X, Y, Z. And I, I want to make sure that they fully understand the gospel, that this just doesn't mean, hey, I'm going to do better. And so we talk through that a little bit. And then I just say, hey, when I made this decision, I just prayed to God 
God. It wasn't like this big moment. There weren't a lot of tears. It was just like me acknowledging, oh, like, hey, God, I'm separated from you, and there is no way that I can have a relationship with you outside of what Jesus has done for me, and I trust in Jesus, and I trust you as Lord of my life. So it's not this big moment. I feel like that some people maybe think, but that's what it looked like for me. So that's a good question. Any others? All right, what if they're the first ex and they say they don't believe? What do you do? You tell them they're going to hell? I mean. (laughs) I don't say that, actually. Um, (laughs) But that was a great question. Um, I typically just kind of ask what they do believe. I get familiar with their beliefs. I don't try to convince them. I'm not going to sit there and be like, here's why you need to believe that this is real. And But I just hear them out. I actually, um, about a year and a half ago, shared with a girl, and she said she was there. And I just kind of heard her out. And process, kept sharing the gospel with her, and she came to Christ not too long later. And so it's the Lord. I'm not going to sit there and, like, argue and tell them why they need to believe it, but just kind of hear them out and then process from there if they want to keep meeting with me to hear more about Jesus. So there was one over here. It's like a, a biblical question, and you aren't sure what the answer is. Yeah, so what do I do yeah. if they ask a question and I don't know? I say, I'm so sorry, I don't know that answer, but I really wanna figure it out. And so can I get back to you? And so that's what that looks like. And maybe that's me going to my Bible and finding the answer, or it's me going to a godly man or a godly woman that I really respect and saying, hey, what are your thoughts on this? I don't know how to answer this question. So I just, I feel like that shows care that you're just like not gonna throw, I mean, say that you're gonna actually figure it out for them, not just like, Oh, I don't know, you know, so that's what I do. What's your response when they become argumentative or even combative to what you're sharing? Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like I haven't experienced that much, um, but I probably would just be very, like, humble of just, or try to be very humble and not try to argue with them if they're like, hey, like, if that's what you think or whatever, like, I mean, we just have to agree to disagree. And so I probably wouldn't try to keep that conversation going. I would just say that you're open to, like, talking about it more in the future if they wanted to hear more about it. But I wouldn't try to sit and argue. I feel like that just doesn't really get anywhere. So it's a good question. I'm no expert at this either. I'm sure, like, you can ask Jason some of these questions too or other people. Like, I don't want to pretend like I have all this together. Uh, I've been asked, well, what about all the starving children of the world? Yeah. So, like, can you clarify a little bit more on there? Who's our Savior? Is he uh, going to take care of us? And yeah. Why doesn't he take care of the starving children? Yeah. Uh, I would say, yeah, that's really sad, and that breaks God's heart, too. Um, he wants to see every single person coming to know him, and that's why I am sharing the gospel with you today, because... I want to make him known in all the earth, too. And so that breaks his heart way more than it breaks our heart. And so that's probably how I'd respond to that. That kind of threw me. That was a good one. (laughs) Threw me for a loop. Well, I'm basically a a pretty good old boy, and I do all the right things. And, you know, I I don't drink. I don't cheat on my wife. Why why do I want this eternal life? Yeah, that's a great question. (laughs) Um, So that was kind of my... Test, I thought I was good enough, and my, the Brooke, who shared the gospel with me, just told me, like, hey, that's not good enough. You are still sinful, and you're still separated from God, and the only way to have a relationship with him is by trusting in Jesus. If they just don't want God, if they're just saying, like, my life is good, and I don't want him, then that's just going to be, there's nothing I don't think that I can say to change their heart, and so I just pray for them and trust God to move in their life. Good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Claire is saying just kind of redefining what sin is because a lot of us think like we, we think we're good people and we are, I mean we are like nice people and so but just if you clarify like what sin is it's like even the nicest person in the world is still sinful to a holy God. And so just kind of going back to that of like you are sinning against a holy, just God and your one sin deserves punishment. And so 
kind of just going back through that. That was good, Claire. before you actually invite them to eat lunch with you? I mean, the relationship you build, How? what's that phase that you kind of go through before you get to that step instead of, I know you don't just jump right in and yeah. say, hey, let's just sit down and talk about God. Yeah, that's good. So if this is, so there's kind of two ways to do this. I have shared this like cold turkey, like just with strangers and random people. That's not my favorite way to do it. I really love to build a relationship with girls, befriend them, take an interest in them, have them over for dinner and just show them that I care about them. And then maybe I feel like there's not a perfect timeline for each person. It's kind of just how the Lord maybe is working in their life or how they respond to me, if they're very warm to me and open, I'll share within the first month of just building that friendship. And I also don't see these girls like every single day. It's So it kind of takes maybe a little bit to build that relationship. But I feel like just when I have a pretty decent relationship with them, I like to share my faith. And so, but I'm always in those times being with them, I will maybe share my testimony or ask them if they grew up in church and kind of work towards getting to share my faith. That way it's not like, out of the blue and just random like I've never talked about Jesus before and then here I am telling you this and so I think hope that answered your question time for a couple more anybody else back in the day doing this you will find in your pathway that actually the people who are steeped in sin and brokenness are 5,000 times easier to reach than the person that believes that they, they believe in God, they know him, but they don't have a relationship with him and they're good. And that's where, you know, like you said, it takes time to love them and they have to see that you really love them and you care and pray for them mm -hmm. and have the Holy Spirit reveal in them where they are and what is what is sin? Because sin can be good things too, as we sometimes don't realize that. Yeah, that's so good. that's and by by that we have had three of the people that we won to the Lord by going the old way, knocking on the doors, have gone on to heaven, and they and I am so grateful that we had that opportunity to share with them and see them grow in the Lord. That's, that's good. Awesome. Praise God. All right, last one. I'm guessing we don't want this to look like a drive-by salvation moment. So when somebody says, yeah, or they say, I'm, I'm interested in more, and maybe this is as much a question for Jason as it is for you, what do we, what do, we do to get them connected with the local church? Because it isn't, a, okay, I'm done, back to how life was before. That was a great question, a perfect last question, because that's going to lead me into my final point of helping them with next steps. So literally answers it perfectly. Great transition. <laughs> um, so we'll cover it there. And if you have any questions afterwards with it, we can talk. But um, so lastly, in the handout, last step is help with next steps. So since our goal is not to just make converts, we don't want to just convert people to Christianity and then say, see ya, never talking to you again. We want to make disciples who make disciples. So sharing the gospel and even leading someone to Christ is not the finish line. It's really just the starting line. So we want to help people with next steps. Where do they go from here? Just like he was asking. So four ways um, that we can help them with next steps are welcome. So if they say yes, welcome them into the family of God. This is an exciting moment. They might not realize how exciting it is. I don't think I did eight years ago. But now it's the moment I look back to that was the most decisive moment of my life. And so welcome them and start helping them become a disciple. And then the next way is in the word. Help them start reading their Bible consistently. A lot of the girls that I meet with don't even have a Bible. And so that's one of the first things I do. I go and buy them one and teach them how to read their Bible because that is what's going to change them. You meeting with them once a week it, or something, maybe you see them once a week, that might help them grow some, but if they can get in the Word every single day, and 
I mean, look at God's word that transforms them and read it and take it in, then that's how they're going to grow. And so um, you could meet up with them together to teach them how to read the Bible. You can get them started on maybe a Bible plan on the Bible app or just get my favorite thing to point people to is the book of John. I feel like it's a perfect start for new believers or maybe people that aren't ready to make that step, but they're interested in investigating their faith. The next is worship. So invite them to church. Emphasize the importance of community. Christianity is a team sport, and no one can follow Christ alone. They need to know that, and they need to see you living that out in your local community, too. And then lastly, it might be a surprising one, but witness. So if someone trusts Jesus, a great question to ask is, hey, who do you know that needs to hear this? And so I often will take girls with me if they're like, oh, my friend Mallory needs to hear this. Then I'll take this new believer with me to watch me share the same illustration because they can just hear it again and maybe even get to just see what I'm doing and that would lead to them doing the same thing one day. And so teach them how to witness, to get involved in the church, how to spend time in the word and just welcome them into the family of God. So if they aren't ready to trust Christ, Continue to welcome them into your life. Be their friend, love them, and sh continue sharing the gospel with them. I'm not meaning like keep sitting down every week to show them this. That would probably be overkill. But keep just talking through the gospel. Talk about what you read in your Bible or what you learned at church that week. And just continue putting the gospel and sowing seeds. Um, also, something to uh, no, it's just being really attentive to what they're saying as you're sharing Romans 6.23. So if Haley would have said, hey, I'm a two, and or I'm this person, and here's why. I'm not ready to make that decision. I don't want to give up sin. I don't want to change my life. And so if I listen to that and then start thinking through her answer, I don't need to just right then and there give her every reason she needs to give up her sin, but maybe the next time I'm with her, I would talk through why Jesus, following Jesus is better than sin. And so just kind of hearing those holdups, what are their obstacles? Do they, can they not trust the Bible or can they not give up sin or do they think that they can earn their way to heaven, which is really common in our Bible belt. So you can take them to scripture and other resources to kind of help them with their holdups. So this is how to share your faith with confidence. The four steps, realize what success is, use a line, share the clear gospel, and help with next steps. So I taught you one way to share your faith, and don't worry, I'm not going to teach you another one, but I do want to introduce to you another tool. Um, and so Romans 6.23 is a great tool when you have like 10 minutes of limited distractions, like I said, but that's not always an option. Every person you meet, you're not like, hey, let's go have coffee for, 10, or for an hour and I'll share the gospel with you. Um, so I wanna introduce, just introduce to you one more tool that's really effective and it's your personal testimony. So I mentioned it earlier, there's an outline in your handout, but I think a testimony is awesome because you get to share your story. You get to share what Jesus has done in your life, and no one can deny your story. So when they hear that, they can't say, well, I don't believe that because it's your story and it's true. And so your testimony is just so great to have that you can share on the fly. And so I would encourage you all this week to go through that handout and just kind of write out what did your life look like before Christ? How did you come to know him? And how has that changed your life since? Because you can share that. You can have different versions of your testimony. I share it different ways depending on how much time I have or who I'm talking to. But you can share your testimony in two minutes. And, that, and you always should include the gospel in your testimony to share what Jesus has done in your life. And so that's another great tool when sharing your faith. And I actually want to have Haley come back up here and she's going to share her testimony just so you can kind of hear what this might sound like if you, as you begin pre to prepare yours. So. 
Hello. Okay. Um, my name's Haley. I'm a senior at OU, um, and I'm excited to get to share my testimony with y'all. I'm really thankful to be here. So um, I didn't grow up in a spiritual home at all. My faith or God wasn't something that we talked about. Um, it just wasn't something that was in my home or in my family at all. Um, and so I um, just kind of said I believed in God, and I my life didn't reflect that at all, though. So that's all I did um, was say that I believed in God, and I knew that there was a God, but that's my life just didn't reflect it. Um, and so then I go into high school and I just am living for myself as I have before that my whole life, um, but just living for what I wanted and my desires. Um, and so I just fall into what the world had for me um, and just falling into drinking, into boys and um, partying and just living that lifestyle that I thought would fulfill me, trying to find something that I could fill this void with that I never um, just kept searching for, but never found something to fulfill. Um, and so I go into college doing the same thing, um, just trying to find something that would uh, maybe just be lasting, but nothing would. Um, and so a few weeks into my college life at OU, um, I'm sitting in the cafeteria alone, and Devin actually walks up to me and asks to sit with me, and I had no idea who she was, and I was kind of confused, like, why does she want to sit down with me? I don't know her at all. Um, and I just said, yeah, sure, why not? You can sit with me. And so she did. Um, and she basically just asked me about my life. She starts to be just intentional with getting to know me and like wants to just know me deeply. And I was just like, I don't have any friends like this. Like this is different. And so I noticed that she had just had something different um, about her that I just didn't know what it was, um, but it was Jesus. Um, and so after that moment, she gets my number. We start to like hang out. We start to just be friends. Um, she invites me in on just her life. And we start just doing life together. Um, and then one day she sits down with me at lunch and she um, shares this illustration with me. She shares the gospel with me. Um, and so she says that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, past, present, and future, so that you could have a relationship with him, so that you could live eternally with him. And I had never heard that before. I had never heard that I could have a relationship with God. And so that just like blew my mind, that I could talk to God personally, that I could know him and that he could know me. Um, and so um, after that, well, she also like asked me this question that really clicked. Um, she was like, if you were standing at the gates of heaven and he were to ask you, why should I let you in? Um, what would you say? And I said, I'm a good person, I believe in God, I do good things, and I'm nice to people. And um, she was like, well, it's actually nothing that you do. It's not that you can win your way into heaven. Um, it's not that you do good things. It's that you just trust in Jesus um, Christ that died for your sins, um, and that you actually follow him and not just believe, um, but that you follow in him, or that you follow him. And so... Um, after that, I was like, okay, this makes so much sense to me. I like, I get it now. Like I just hadn't heard that my whole life. No one has just like cared enough about me to like sit me down and say that to me. And so she asked me that day if I wanted to give my life to Jesus. And I was like, yes, I don't know what that looks like, but yes, I want to do that. And so she, um, after that, she bought me my first Bible. She didn't just leave me at that. She bought me my first Bible. She taught me how to read it. We started going through different scriptures together and um and then I started just living for Jesus and after that and so since making that decision like three and a half years ago um I can say that that was the best decision I've ever made um and I'm just really thankful that Devin was bold enough in her faith to share that with me and so yeah that's my story <laughs> thanks Haley um you guys, I was so intimidated to go up to her in the cafeteria. She was so pretty, had her little sorority shirt on, but so grateful that I did because, I mean, Haley now, it's like I got to pass on to her what I knew, and then she is doing that and has been doing that for the past three years on her campus, at her job, um, in her sorority, and so you just never know what God can do. When you step out in faith, you're going to be scared to share your faith, but he, you just, I never would have imagined that now one of my best friends, I mean, three and a half years later to see where she is and how God has grown her. I'm like, you guys just share your faith because you don't know what he'll do. And so as a final tip, I just want to say one of the best ways that you can live this life of just sharing your faith, though actually live it out is to have a community of people around you that are challenging you in evangelism. If if you never talk about sharing your faith after tonight, then most likely, most likely you won't 
continue sharing. And that's even been true of my life. When I haven't had people in my life that I was regularly meeting with saying, hey, Devin, who are you sharing your faith with? Or when's the last, when did you share your gosp- the gospel last? Or who are some girls in your life that you want to be sharing with soon? Or who are you praying for? And so I would just say if, if you don't have those people in your life, then it's going to be really hard to share your faith because it's not the popular thing. It's not what everyone else is doing. And so find those people. Maybe it's one other person that you're just checking in with every month saying, hey, have you gotten to share your faith this week? And it's not meant to like, you know, put you down if you haven't, but it is that encouragement of just like, oh yeah, I need to be reminded of of this. And so I want to encourage you guys right now to write down on one of your handouts just three people that come to mind when you think of someone who needs to hear this. Maybe you don't know their eternal destiny. You don't know if they're following Jesus or not, but maybe you think, they might not be, and they really need to hear this illustration. It could be a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, but just take a moment and write three people down. So I wanna encourage you guys to start praying for these three people daily and pray for opportunities to share the gospel with them. And you will, I think you'll just be amazed at what God will do and the opportunities he will present and how burdened you will feel for their salvation. Um, Claire said it this morning, but basically we're missing the point if we're not actively trying to reach lost people around us. The Bible says that Jesus came and to seek and to save the lost. And so literally his purpose for coming to earth was to save the lost. And so we aren't meant to just go to church together or go to our community groups and just be around other believers. We're meant to live an outward life and to constantly or consistently be bringing people into the family of God. So evangelism isn't just for the spiritual elite. It's not just for the church staff. It's not just for people who think they might be gifted in evangelism. It's for you it's for me, it's for all Christians. So when I look at a room this size, I really do, I've said it a million times tonight, I think, but I just get so excited as I see you practicing sharing your faith and just to think about if you guys are to go out and share your faith with your coworkers and family and friends and neighbors, like you guys have so many relationships and you have them for a purpose and it's for God's glory and Um, I'm just excited to see how he will use a room this size to impact the community and the world. So thank you guys for being here so much. It's a joy to get to do this with you all. Um, One of the things that I've I've been praying for is that uh, our city would be different because of what God has done in us and what he does through our church and uh, we really did have a conversation. I thought 30 people were going to be here tonight, and I was going to be excited about that. Uh, there's 165 people here tonight, and I'm just praying that God works through you uh, in particular. Uh, there's a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of brokenness in our city, uh, a lot of people that need Jesus Christ, and God has seen fit to connect us to them in various ways, various relationships. And so there's a harvest out there. It's the workers that are few, and we have an opportunity to go to sow into the harvest field. When we talk about the law of sowing and reaping, it's not just in our lives too, but we have an opportunity to sow into the lives of others. And so that's a great joy. I really did. I, I'm truly, truly thankful that you took the time to be here. Truly thankful for you and Haley for sharing with us. A huge blessing. Uh, one more thing I want to tell you about tonight is that both of these girls, um, they raise their own support. Uh, and so Devin has done this. How many years now? Four. Four years. And there's nobody that's like, hey, I'm just going to pay your salary for four years, but rather she depends on people like us uh, to help pay for her way to go and to enable her to be on college campuses. Uh, She's been ministering to my niece Addison, or Stumo has been ministering to my niece Addison and connected with her. Uh, What a joy. We have a a couple in the back that they actually knew her. And so uh, God is doing a great work through Stumo. So Devin is going to be around here after tonight. Uh, Some of you have already had meetings with her. I would encourage you just to say, hey, God, would would you have me be a part of supporting either Devin or Haley's going to be starting. She's graduating college very soon. She's going to be launching next year. Uh, 
This is a great way to sow into the kingdom financially. It doesn't let us off the hook for sharing the gospel ourselves, but it extends our reach where we get to participate in the gospel being shared elsewhere. So they're going to be around for a short while afterward. Uh, just come ready with your checkbook, ready to sign a couple hundred dollars a month. You don't have to do that much, but a uh, hundred dollars a month or so goes a long way toward enabling them to continue to do the work that they're doing. College campuses are a harvest field. So I would encourage you, I would challenge you, dig deep, give up your coffee for the year, whatever it would take, uh, do what it takes to support these young ladies. My wife and I do it. Uh, as a church, we're supporting uh, Devin, and we're going to continue to do that. So I want to say a word of prayer over us tonight. Uh, thank you again for being here. Let's ask God just to continue to use us. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would use, use me and use every single individual in this room to think that if, if even we all of us led one person to Christ this year uh, through sharing the gospel, and it might take one time, it might take a hundred times, but that we could find uh, just joy in sharing the gospel message with people that desperately need to hear it. Uh, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would, in your power, that you would draw men and women to yourself and use weak individuals like us. God, I know our presentations are going to be imperfect. Our knowledge is going to be imperfect. We're not able to draw anyone, but you are. God, we know that you desire to save, uh, to draw men and women to yourself, and so would you use us in that process, and may we celebrate with joy when you do in the hearts of others what you've done in our own hearts. We just thank you so much for the gospel, for the good news, for uh, the gift of Jesus. Jesus Christ in our life, the salvation that we have. And God, we pray that one year from now, our community would be different because of what you did through us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight.